The Dark Wheel by Robert Holmstock. The best way to see the wreck place at Tyan Isla is to approach it from the sun, a reasonably safe thing to do, since Tyan Isla, being a democracy, has few pirates in its system. Tyan Isla itself is a bright yellow world, and the cemetery is always between the planet and its star. As you fly close, the whole strange graveyard seems to be expanding from the circle of the world behind. The first thing you see is a shimmering silver disc, a double spiral of tiny bright points. It slowly turns. It's a galaxy in miniature, with the same intense blur of light at its centre. Because here is where the biggest tombs are to be found. Come closer, and soon you can see that the stars in the galaxy are markers, great lumps of metal heavily inscribed with the words and symbols of a thousand religions. The cemetery is a bizarre and moving sight. The markers are rarely less than a thousand feet across. There are chrome alloy crosses, titanium stars of David, duralium hengers, and all the strange symbolic shapes of the worlds and the minds and the faiths that have come to die in this star traveller's special place. Tethered below this vast rotating mausoleum is the dodecahedral shape of a dodo class space station, the home of the cemetery authorities. Here you go through security checks and get your visitor's visa, and as you stand in the queue staring up through the translucent ceiling of the customs hall, you can see the battered broken ships of many of the dead still attached to the silent tomb that contains the body. It's a good enough reason to come to Tynesla. There are pickings aplenty amongst the wrecks. The treasures of centuries might be revealed by pressing the right panel on the right cube of black alien metal as it floats silently by. Or, or maybe not treasure, just the tomb's defences. A pit with a laser. A robot guardian with knives where its hands should be. A hyperspace vacuum that sucks you in and throws you out into another time. You tread carefully among the wrecks in orbit about Tynesla. The creatures buried here, human and alien, had money enough to buy these prized resting places, and more than enough wealth to protect their property after death from the mercenary fingers of bounty hunters. Formalities completed, his newly issued pilot's license checked, Alex Ryder was given a small tour ship, an oddly shaped and cumbersome vessel. He drifted quickly among the tombs, seeking the resting place of star pilot Fleischer, following coordinates on the ship's cemetery plan. He soon found what he was looking for. Whoever Fleischer had been, he was monstrously egocentric. His tomb was a great crystalline structure, a puffball of diamond-bright needles, literally hundreds of feet across. His body, dressed in the red uniform of an elite combatier, hovered in stasis at the centre of this great construct, illuminated by focused light from the sun. Tethered to the simple monument of the grave next to this was the battered, blistered shape of a Cobra-class ship, its insignia still proudly displayed, but all its vital equipment, its fuel scoop, its extra cargo base, its aft missile and laser banks, removed. Alex stared at it. It looked nothing like the Cobra that had destroyed his father's ship. That vessel had been bristling with all the extra things that good money could buy to defend and attack and make the trading game an easier prospect for the elite trader. A light on the Cobra winked at him. Alex blinked, then looked again. Sure enough, a small red light was flashing on and off. A brief sequence of code. Land on door pl. Land on the dorsal plate, and that was clear enough. Alex manoeuvred his tiny craft above the arrow shape of the Cobra and touched it gently onto the heat-blistered hull. He looked round guiltily. Touching monuments wasn't permitted, and the cemetery was patrolled by crates, small and deadly security craft, with instructions to blast away any man, woman or child seen tampering with a mausoleum. But the graveyard was huge. 
and the shadows of the great tombs transferred this miniature world of the dead into a place of hideouts and shifting occasional safety. An entry port opened and a green light quickly blinked the message, come aboard. Alex flew the tour ship into the hull space and when he got the pressure green signal, stepped out and walked cautiously towards the main control area. He opened the sliding door and blinked for a moment at the bright control displays and scanners. Ahead of him, the main screen was wide and filled with a view of Fleischer's crystal tomb. Silhouetted against the gleaming brightness of the crystal was the shape of a man wearing full spacesuit. One hand rested on the navigation console, the other hovered above the laser button. I'm aboard, Alex said, and walked up behind the silent pilot. The man made no movement, said nothing. For a moment, Alex stood beside him, staring out into the wreck place, at the slowly shifting monuments, at the stars glimpsed in the background. Then he turned to greet his host, and nearly died of shock, taking a quick, horrified step backwards. It was the drawn, mummified face of a corpse that half looked up at him from behind its visor, the rictus smile of death stretching wide across its lips. D do you think we should take him with us? A voice asked him from across the cabin. Alex started again with surprise and watched the figure which emerged from the shadows. That's a sort of totem, a lucky charm. Alex tried to smile, but neither relief nor the new arrival's charming grin could relax him enough. Too much had happened too fast, and he stood rooted to the spot, watching as the woman came over to him. She was quite small. Her skin was olive, her eyes dark. She wore her hair in a fashionable series of spikes, like a porcupine. Dressed in the light green coveralls that most traders sported, she seemed swamped by clothes. Her hand touch was cool and confident, and she kept the contact as she looked up at Alex Ryder, still smiling disarmingly. So you're the man that Raph has chosen. Well, Alex, so far, it seems that star riding with you is at least going to be quiet. You do, uh, uh, she frowned. You do have a speech function? She turned to him slightly and felt up his back for a switch. Or are you one of the early semaphore and gormless grin models? Sorry, Alex said. She took me by surprise. Oh, God, the woman said. Where's the off switch? I think I prefer you silent. Who are you? Alex asked, irritated by her levity and keen to find out why Raph Zeta had summoned him here. Where was the old man? Trade of fields, she said, and touched the heel of her right hand to her left shoulder by way of salute. My given name is Elissa, Elissa Fields, she smiled again. My broodmother's little joke. She discovered Greek mythology at age nine when she was incubating her first cluster. Broodmother, Greek, incubating clusters. That meant that Elissa Fields was from Tiorge, the so-called clone world. Alex struggled to remember what had been taught about Tiorge. An inhabited world, settled by two colony ships that had proceeded to clone a select few of the crew and colonists, killing the others. For centuries, Tiorg had been a world apart, cut off from the normal flow of trade and commerce, and banned from sending representatives into space. Elissa Fields was clearly a fugitive. I'm Alex Ryder, Alex said. I know. The woman said back, breaking the gaze with which she'd been fixing him. She patted the corpse on the shoulder, an oddly affectionate gesture. This is, or rather was, space trader Henry Bell. We're going to purloin Mr Bell's coffin. Of all the people who are going to object, he's going to be the most objectionable. That rust bucket is set up with hollow projections of our man here, warning of dire consequences for invading his sanctity. I've turned most of them off, but I expect I've missed a few. We're going to steal this ship, Alex said quietly, checking the flickering control display panel, which light fuel registered enough for 0 0.1 light year jump, hardly sufficient to clear the Tynesla system. Alicia stared at him, a half smile on her lips. We could pass the time chatting if you prefer, plant some flowers, clean the tomb up. I meant, 
Alex said dryly. How the hell are we going to get away with it? He found himself staring at the pert features of the humanoid female. The shadow of gloom and grief that had haunted him for the last few hours seemed to fade a little. The girl interested him. He added, and just why are you helping me anyway? Where's Raph? With a quick laugh, Alicia said, Funny thing about Raph, wherever you go in the galaxy, he's always there. A shimmering white hollow fact. But where he really is, that's something you're about to find out. She glanced up at Alex. Why am I helping you? Who, who says I am? We'll be helping each other, in fact. You have a father to avenge. I have some things to avenge, too. Maybe I'll tell you about them one day. But without you, I cannot fly this ship. Surprised, Alex said, Cobras were made to be flown by a single pilot. But I'm a single Teorgian. I'm not supposed to be here. I can fly this bucket with my eyes closed, but your face fits. Listen, Alex, this craft wouldn't survive the first attack by a pirate with a pea shooter. No matter how good we are behind the laser button, we need shields, missiles, defences and cargo space. How do you think we're going to get them? They don't grow on silvery moons, you know. Trade for them, Alex said gloomily, and the vista of his family's long life trading through the stars swept before his eyes. Alicia was right. He couldn't go hunting a cobra without the proper equipment, and it would take too long to sort out his inheritance, bearing in mind the circumstances of his father's death. He felt utterly overwhelmed with frustration. A part of him wanted to kill right now. A part of him wanted to rip out into the space lanes and hunt his father's killers. But the best part of him knew that would be a recipe for disaster. That patience was called for. That a tactical approach of how he would set about the hunt was essential. And that a protected ship was the barest necessity. I've got a hundred credits in all the world. Alex said, referring to the Galactic Emergency Services loan that had been given to get him home. It's a start, said Alicia. It's a start in the trading business, as Raff would say. We'll give this old lass an iron ass. Her face darkened, though the flickering lights from the console were bright in her eyes. Then we'll go to a place that I suspect only Raff's Zeta knows, and we'll watch a lot of heartache burn up, courtesy of some fine shooting by the both of us. We'll get the ship that put an end to your father. It's a ship that has a lot to answer for. But she will say no more than that. For anyone reckoning on beginning a space trading career from scratch, the hardest task is finding a ship. Each planetary system has its floating junkyards, its second-hand craft, its impounded vessels, eventually auctioned by the police. Most places advertise for co-pilots to work without pay for four years with the guarantee of a ship at the end of it, if they're still alive. But ships are expensive, even if they're from the scrap heap. Alex was impressed and startled by the audacity of the theft that was being proposed. In response to Raff's plan, the fugitive, who'd been hiding out in the dead craft for nearly a year, had managed to accumulate the fuel, food and power to make the brief hyperspace jump to the interstellar junkyard. All that had been missing was the right co-pilot, someone who could actually do the trading without arousing suspicion. They hauled the mummified body of Henry Bell to the small tour ship and set the craft adrift. Whatever happens now, Alicia said, as they took the positions at the bridge consoles, you're going to get an offender status tag. But Raph thinks if you respect the body, they'll just post it at Tynisla itself. Destroy the body and they'll probably notify most worlds in the vicinity. We can't afford that. Here goes. On the screen, the small tour ship drifted away, and the crowded monuments of the cemetery swung past in a dizzying array of bright and shadowy surfaces. Alex studied the scanners and monitors carefully. They had only tiny energy supply to fore and aft screens, a blast or two of laser power. No missiles, of course. The craft was still locked on to the Dodo space station, whose position was shown by the darting bright point in the triaxial grid map. Slowly, the Cobra turned and began to move gently, silently, towards the edge of the spiral grave field. 
The scanner scanned, and Alex watched it hard, alert and apprehensive for the telltale wink of its moving green light. The duller colours of the tombs and stationary craft crowded the scanning screen, moving slowly past. There's something I ought to tell you about uncontrolled witch space jumps, Elysius said, and Alex felt a moment's irritation. I already know, thanks. Besides, wherever we're going, we're only going a tenth of a light year, and that's reasonably safe. Elysius sniggered. What god or goddess do you believe in? Randomius Factoria, Alex muttered. Me too. They looked at each other. Alex laughed and said, repeat after me, a lady of fate, we adore you. Get us to rafts, we implore you. The monuments and monoliths drifted by. The star field widened ahead of them. Nearly there, Alicia breathed. Get ready for the jump. Alex watched the scanner and two bright points of light appeared, moving rapidly towards them. Company, he said. Alicia swore loudly. We've not got much laser power, Alex said. Use our laser and any chance of trading goes. Those are police. They may not be vipers, but they're police nevertheless. Damn. Ahead of them, the starfield was almost clear. The two security craft veered apart to close in from the sides. Alicia began to count down, finger resting on the simple trigger that would dispatch them far away. Ten seconds? The cobra vibrated and whined, unused to activity after many years in stasis. They're closing! Fire coming in! Five seconds? The cobra screeched as a laser shot glanced off its hull. The shield energy, low as it was, vanished. The attacking craft overshot. Its colleague friend fired and missed, manoeuvring with difficulty around a large henge monument that slowly revolved at the edge of the cemetery. Three. Lining up. Fire coming in. The two craft were together again. Their laser fire played in the void around the cobra. Two. There was a strike, a scream of pain. The vessel almost rocked out of control and then... Star tunnel. Alicia flopped back in her chair. Alex cheered. When he looked at the woman, he saw that she was drenched with sweat. When he reached a hand towards her, his fingers were shaking uncontrollably. You've got a ship, said Raph. You've got money. You've got a co-pilot who is a better shot than you, but not for long, I hope. Now it's up to you, young Alex. And one thing more. If Jason were here, he'd have this to say. In time of trouble, forget common sense, forget the force. Do what you gotta and feel like. If it don't work, one thing's for sure, you ain't gonna be around to regret it. Seated at the astrogation console of the Cobra, Alex watched Raff's home on the forward screen. It, it was a much modified and quite bizarre looking anaconda cruiser. Its cargo bay dented, its fuel scoop ripped open, its hull lights blinking not so much with meaning as with disrepair. Raff had not invited him aboard. At 0.1 light years from Tyanisla, he was safe from detection, and here he stayed, in the cold and silence of interstellar space, collecting ships, fuel, food and weapons. Three members, small fighters, were tethered to the service bay on the anaconda's hull, robots crawling all over them as they patched up the shot-up vessels. Unlike humans, robots could work without arc lights. When the graveyard ship had arrived at Raf Setter's private system, Raf's hollow fac had appeared in the cabin. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of while to get supplies for the sort of mission you're about to go on. I'll fuel your ship enough to get you to Isinor, but from then on, you're on your own. You're going to need missiles, operational lasers, an energy bomb, a fuel scoop, a whole bunch of other things. An iron ass, Alex muttered with a smile. That's right, and I don't want to hear from you again until you've scalped that cobra that killed Jason. Why are you doing this for me? I'm doing it for Jason, Raph said, and for others besides. And listen, Alex, don't you go worrying about Raxler. Not yet. That comes in time. But why did he say it? To let me know he trusted you. Your father reckoned you have it in you to become one of the elite. That's good enough for me. 
Alex's head span. What was this old man saying now? Not just that Jason Ryder had been an elite combatier, but that he'd seen the same potential in his son? In sim combat, Alex had often built up a success and survival score that had awarded him the simulator's highest accolade, a victory roll over the mock-up of the old Earth City of London. But he'd never thought that in real life he would ever achieve a combat status higher than dangerous. To be elite, a dizzying prospect, and a nerve-wracking one, with all that it implied of not just fighting off freebooters, but of spending time as a bounty hunter, deliberately hyperspacing into dangerous planetary systems and waiting for pirates to come to you, looking for trouble, in other words, boosting your combat status to the maximum by advertising yourself to killers and outgunning them. One thing's for sure, Raff went on dryly, unless you get there, unless you become elite, you'll never get to Raxler, and you'll never know exactly what your father was searching for. I don't understand. Were you aware of his involvement in the Dark Wheel? Shock after shock, the Dark Wheel was a semi-legendary space unit. Star riders who made it their business to seek the truth behind the plethora of myths and romantic stories that filtered back from all corners of the universe, fabulous cities, parallel worlds, time travellers, even planets that appeared to be the old heaven of Earth legend. The Dark Wheel was as mysterious and as mythical to the traders of the galaxy as King Arthur might have been to the first spacemen. It's not possible, Alex breathed. He would have told us. The hell he would, Raff said, staring at the younger man from the shimmering hollow fac on the bridge. The ship that killed Jason was no pirate. He was killed because he'd found something. Something that certain parties were deeply unhappy that he'd found. What exactly? Raff laughed. Listen to the boy. Look at me, Alex. Do I look whole? Do I? Well, I ain't. One leg, some of my liver, a few brain cells. That's all that's left of the real me. The rest is just bionic. Trying to do what your father did. I got shot to hell and back. I was elite once. Now takes me ten seconds to decide to spit. He didn't tell me because I'm not part of it anymore. Not to that degree. But I watch and I listen and I do what I'm told. And as sure as there's gold flake on the skin of a Garitan, Jason Ryder told me to get you ready to follow in his footsteps. Coming so soon after his father's death, with the memory of Jason's murder so vivid in his mind, it was almost too much for Alex. He didn't know whether to glow with pride or to shake with apprehension. He slowly sat down at the astrogation console and played his fingers over the controls of the Cobra. After a while, he smiled and shrugged away the confusion and the sadness he was feeling. Right, if that's what my father wanted, then I shan't disappoint him. Out of which space, the dizziness, the slight shudder, the brief disorientation. Ahead of them, the distant red-blue disk of the planet Xizor was only slightly brighter than the gleaming field of stars around. The planet's sun was dim and very close by. It glowed red. A dying star, as the world ahead of them was dying world. A cooling world, a world whose wealth and industrial development could not hold back the process of galactic ageing. Xizor was a world where luxuries and warmth meant everything now. And Shanaskilk fur, with the multiple heads still intact, would fetch a high price. Routine. A routine trade run. Lysia dozed, Alex punched coordinates into the autopilot and prepared to pass the time of the long run into the world. Routine. A routine which Alex was by now well used to. Out of which space and then the slow approach until the Coriolis station came on target. Nothing to do. Nothing to see. The cobra rocked and a sound like a screech of metal being bent apart echoed through the bridge. Company! 
Alex said loudly, and Alicia blinked awake. She must have assessed the situation in an instant. She remained where she was. Alex was at the console, and there were only seconds available for thought. Alex had been taken by surprise, not because he hadn't been paying attention, but because the attack ships had been so close to the egress point from hyperspace, with their tiny hulls between him and the glowing sun, they'd not been visible for an instant, and they'd been performing a tumbling routine, mimicking slow-moving asteroids. Alex had half noticed them and half ignored them. They'd got the first shot in, and then overflown the Cobra. Now, they grouped behind as Alex punched up maximum speed and scanned space for them. Here they come. The shield screamed as laser fire played off them. Beam lasers? Those ships were well equipped. But then, now, so was the Nemesis. The dramatic name that he and Alicia had given to their ship. Alex checked the rear monitor and lined up the firing window. He stabbed out two bursts of fire from the newly installed aft laser. The pirate ships veered apart. One of them struck. As he had them on the screen, he targeted a missile. A missile from one of the attacking craft began to weave towards them, and his screen flashed with warning. Alex operated the Nemesis's ECM, and after an agonisingly long few seconds, the incoming missile vanished in a burst of heat and light. The hull screeched, and Alex dived. He noticed that the shields had begun to put a drain on the first energy unit. Alicia sat calm and quiet while Alex handled the situation. Ahead of them, the planet edged closer, rising and falling and spinning in a dizzying way as Alex fought for a better combat position. Then instinct took over. He looped the Cobra a full 180 degrees and raced head-on at the pirate vessel that had been behind them. Now he could see that it was a Ferdelance a sleek, fast ship that was probably loaded down with sophisticated navigational and defence equipment that had been installed by the original owner. Or maybe not. Such equipment took cash to maintain, and this ship had seen battle service aplenty. As Pirate and Alex closed, Alex took a chance. They had only four missiles, and one was targeted. He punched for fire, and the Cobra jolted as the deadly sting shot across space. It reached its target, and the Ferdelance literally disappeared. Had it hyperspaced? No. When Alex activated the rear screen, he saw the spreading ash cloud, a silvery glimmer against the stars. Good shooting, Alicia said enthusiastically. Through the cloud of metal and ash, came the other ship. Alex looped again. A laser strike depleted the aft shield even more. But now that the enemy knew that its prey had an anti-missile system, it was going to try and dogfight Alex to destruction. The ship was a Cobra too. Its fuel scoop gaped, ready to suck up the canisters of precious Shanna Skilk fur from the wreckage of the shattered trader. Alex had other ideas. Again, Caesar was ahead of them. Rear shooting, Alex ducked and darted towards safety, and the pirate weaved a snaking pattern against the starfield behind. Alex targeted a missile. Save it if you can, Alicia breathed. I know, Alex said. We can afford a replacement. We won't afford the fuel scoop then, Alicia reminded him, and they both laughed. At a time like this, worried about their shopping list. The space station and the safety it afforded with its own fighter defences was too far away. Alex veered sharply sunwards and dropped his forward velocity dramatically. The pursuing ship copied the first movement precisely, but took a few seconds to orientate to the second. It overshot. Before it knew what was happening, it was no longer the hunter, but the hunted. Go, Alex, go! Alicia shouted as Alex shot off pulse after pulse of laser fire. The cobra on the screen ducked and weaved, but Alex was equal to it, hardly thinking, just reacting. The temperature of his forward laser began to rise dangerously. The cobra ahead of them launched a missile at them, and Alex shot it, not even bothering to program the ECM. Alicia gasped at the cheek of that, and glanced at the young man in whose hands her life was being so capably held. A moment later, it was all over. The pirate exploded, his screen energy finally exhausted. Alex saw the wink and a flash of a jettisoned escape pod, and for a second, remembering the beam of fire that had destroyed his own escape craft, remembering the savage destruction of the Avalonia, he was tempted to go in pursuit. 
his better judgment prevailed. Around them, cargo canisters tumbled like sycamore seeds. And us with no scoop to pick them up, Alicia muttered. Alex grinned. We claim too. That's quite a bounty. Alicia looked down at him as he sat and guided the ship towards Caesar. Alex, you're a natural. It's an honour to ride the stars with you. No one had said a word. Neither of them commented on it. The fact that this has been Alex's first solo combat. <laughs>